Shalom, good morning. We continue our studies. Today is 2 Kings chapters 4 and 5. Today's chapters tells of a few miracles of Elisha, of which every Bible student should know the details. To save me inserting, please read in full or at least listen to them. There will be many chapters of this nature, so it is worth you downloading a listening version of the Bible onto your phone especially if you do not have the time to read. A benefit of reading over listening, especially with the King James Version, is you see inserted words by the translators in italics as the word white we will come in later on. So it's white as snow. When the original only said snow. With listening, you wouldn't know there's a distinction, there's a difference. Okay, reading from... Chapter 4, verse 1, the first miracle, Elisha and the widow's oil. Now they cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophet unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear Yahweh, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondsmen. And the story goes on where Elisha tells her to borrow empty um, containers and basically fills up with oil miraculously and she sells it and pays off her debts. Now like with Elisha's predecessor Elijah who did a miracle with the widow in 1 Kings chapter 17 verses 14 plus Elisha does a similar one with this widow. One lesson to learn is always prepare as best you can for hard times in your and your family's future. In other words, be like the ant, as Proverbs says. For whatever reason, the husband of this woman did not adequately provide for his wife and child. Such provision starts from a child with education and acquiring skills, as many as possible as times change. Hard labour as Abraham essentially did in digging the wells, not borrowing or consuming more than you produce or you harvest or you earn, as some people today live on credit or buy things on credit. The only time the field produced more than the labour you put in was when obeying God. In Leviticus chapter 25, verse 21, God said, Then I will command thy blessings upon you in the sixth year, and it shall bring forth fruits for three years. So wives, do not nag your husbands to borrow or live beyond your means. Do not compare with what others in the world have. Do not provide for your children more than you can or in order to satisfy their desire to live like other people. Those people who have riches today have their reward in this earth. Yours as a follower of God is to come by living God's way. Your wealth or other people's wealth is not in their possession but in your character. Or shall I say godly character. Okay, the second miracle with this Elisha and the Shemamite woman, reading from verse 8. And it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where was a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as often as he passed by, he turned in there to eat bread. And she said unto her husband, Behold, now I perceive that this is an holy man of God, which passeth by us continually. Let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall, and let us set for him there a bed, and a table, and a stool, and a candlestick. And it shall be, when he cometh to us, that he shall turn in here. And it fell on a day that, it, that he came there, and he turned into the chamber, and lay there. Verse 17. And the woman conceived, and bare a son, at that season, that Elijah had said unto her, according to the time of life. When the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father, to the reapers. And he said unto his father, My head, my head. And he said to the lad, Carry him. And he said, Carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. And she called unto her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men, 
and one of the asses, that I may run to the man of God, and come again. And he said, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It is neither new moon, nor Sabbath. And she said, It shall be well. So in the middle of the past I left out, um, Elijah asked with what faith the woman wanted for her kindness to him. Um, her, his servant, I think, said she's still old and childless. So he said that she'll get a child, and she got the child, and the child took him here. Yeah. Now remember the commandment of God in Exodus chapter 31, 13, which says, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath you shall keep. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am Yahweh that thou sanctify you. So the record of the knowing where to find that prophet Elisha was knowing where he would be on Sabbath days. There's also a record of this about the new moon about Saul and David in chapters, 1 Samuel chapter 20 verse 5. So it means the people knew of the Sabbaths and that the prophet of God would be keeping them. If it was a Sabbath day, the mother would have known where to find the prophet is the point. Because that's where they were more. Just as the New Testament talks about Paul and Yeshua, as their manner was, they were always in the synagogues on the Sabbath days. Continuing from verse 40, 38, um, the third miracle of Elijah purified purify the deadly stew. And Elisha came unto Gilgal, and there was a dearth in the land, and the sons of the prophet were sitting before him. And he said unto his servant, Set out the great pot, and seeth, and seeth pottage for the sons of the prophets. And one went out into the field to gather herbs, and found wild vine, and gathered thereof wild gourds, his lap full, and came and shred them into the pot of pottage. For they knew them not, and also that they were poisonous. So they poured out for the men to eat, and it came to pass, as they were eating of the pottage, that they cried out and said, O thou man of God, there is death in the pot, and they could not eat thereof. But he said, Then bring meal, and he cast it into the pot, and he said, Pour out for the people, that they may eat. And there was no harm in the pot. Verse 42, And there came a man from Abel, Bil Shoshisha, and brought the man of God bread of the first fruits, twenty loaves of barley, and four ears of corn in the husk thereof. And he said, Give unto the people that they may eat. The fourth miracle, Naaman healed of leprosy. Reading from verse 51. Now Naaman, captain of the house of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honourable, because by him Yahweh had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valour, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies, and had brought away captive out of the land of, the Is land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her, Mistress, and she said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Shabbat? Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. Verse 9. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot, and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent messages unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times a day, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was angry and went away and said, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of Yahweh his God and strike his hands over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana and Farfa rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, would you not have done that? How much rather then, when he asketh thee to wash and be clean? Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him, and he said, Behold, now I know.
know that there is no God in all earth but in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, take blessing of thy servant. Jump in to the last verse, um, where is where Elisha's servant went and got a, a gift. Um, verse 27. The leprosy therefore Naaman shall creep unto thee and unto thy seed forever. And he went out from his presence a leper as, as snow. And in some Bibles it will have the word inserted as white as snow. But white is in italics. So you see it is an inserted word. The sentence should read, um, he went out from his presence a leper as snow. So the healing was simply by the word of Elisha, as with the Messiah and the Roman centurion, the centurion's servant, in Luke chapter 7, verse 7. Wherefore neither thought, this is where the Roman soldiers are saying to Yeshua, when Yeshua says he doesn't need, need to go to this, um, the Roman servant. Wherefore neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. So in the healing, there was no fanfare, no promotion, no payment, nor, nor many of the church practices as they do today. Are you wanting payment or reward for a blessing? Neither do we ever read of the healers telling others what they did in sermons. The people today always boast what healings they did. It is all in secret except for those who saw it. Matthew chapter 8 verse 4 And Yeshua saith unto him, See thou, tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded, for testimony unto them. And in chapter 5 verse 11, we see how Naaman expected it to be done, as they may be, um, how, as that may be the way that pagan gods do their miracle workers. Um, similar to the practices of today, some great fanfare and so forth. Also, in these biblical versions, the receiver of the healing acted differently to those of today. They weren't pushed on the head to fall backwards like pastors do, fall on the floor, uttering words not easily understood, as 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 9 says it should be, or rolling around on the floor and, and so forth. Frankly, it was as simple as wash and be clean, as it says in verse 13. The only criteria to be clean by God says makes you clean. That's it. God says you'll be clean and you'll be clean. A place, a river, wherever he puts his foot on his name is where you go to be clean. It could even be in your own private bedroom um, without any intervention of a pastor. It will come in a method and at a time that God says. We should have read numerous times how important the number seven is, whether the day, the number of times in this case, or other. There was no first or eighth time. In name, if Naaman had gone away and come back a week later to the river, it may not have worked. He may not have been healed. Similarly, we are to keep all God's commandments of God Exactly as he described, and have faith, we shall be healed if it is will for us at that appointed time. It does not take money, is my point. If you pay money to get healed, your faith is in the money or in the pastor, not in God's word. Or you think his gift can be purchased by money. As Simon in Acts chapter 8 verse 20 with Peter. Any preacher associating money, donation, etc. with receiving healing should not be listened to. Most are making merchandise of you with their books and their ways, as it says in John chapter 2, 16. And said unto them that sold doves, take these things hence, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. I was people coming to church, um, or the pastor coming to church and getting people to buy blessings and so forth. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 3. And through covetousness shall they with faint words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. 
to get healing, obedience, prayer, faith, and the mind of Job is what we should have. Shalom until tomorrow, God willing. Now before we depart, I go back to a bit that was not read out. Um, about the word white and the inserted words in, in that's identifiable in King James's version, but not in your other versions. As I said, the word white is a translator's inserted word. It is not in the original, as indicated by it being in italics. Italics is when it, um, the writing is a different font, it slopes to the right or so. The translators with the Christian mentality could only think the reference to snow was its colour just as they sometimes think the reference to the Sabbath is only the weekly one on the seventh day and they don't realise that all God's holidays are called Sabbaths and they mix up the day of when he died. I think it was a Friday Sabbath, not an annual Sabbath. So back to the word um, white. Actually it was not its snow, the word white, sorry, the, the leprosy and the, and the Similar and similarity to snow was not because of its colour. Actually, it, it, I say it was not the colour, but its smoothness, as this freshness of snow. Snow has many qualities. It has its colour, it has its softness, and it has its smoothness when it first falls. So if a bird or acorn or something steps on it, you can see the imprint of that thing. We see in verse 14 the evidence of the recovery from leprosy was not a colour change, but quality of the skin, i.e. as fresh as a little child, it, the scripture says. If you remember from earlier studies on leprosy, we saw it produce scabs and an uneven skin surface. By the translators inserting the word white, it leads some people to think the person was black. Were that the case, then not only Moses, Miriam, or Hebrew would be black, but all, but also Gentile and Naaman. Where some people say, oh, the Hebrews were black um, and other people were white. But no, if that was the case, then Naaman, who was a Gentile, would also have been black. So you cannot use the leprosy um, comparison and the translator's misinsertion of the word white to say what colour peoples were. Shalom until tomorrow, God willing.